Hello, I'm Dan Rossetto, a senior scientist in the Structural Materials Organization at GE Research in upstate New York. With me is Kareem Agor, a principal scientist in the Artificial Intelligence Organization. Hello. Today we will be giving some highlights from our recent paper published in the MRS Bulletin, Artificial Intelligence in Manufacturing and Inspection, um, a GE Perspective. To begin, let me provide a little background on who we are and what we do. GE Research was the first industrial research lab established in the United States, founded in 1900. Our research is based at two core centers, one in Niskuna, New York, and the other in Bangalore, India. We are made up of about 1,100 researchers organized into 11 technical disciplines set up kind of like a university. The research center has a rich history and world's first, like the J-47 turbojet and the first commercial medical CT and first X-ray imaging machines. In 2017, we announced the world's largest direct metal laser melting additive machine with a one cubic meter build volume. Our role at GE Research is to build background IP and domain expertise in order to differentiate our technology of the core businesses. Those are power, renewables, aviation, and healthcare. Now that we have introduced ourselves, I'd like to show you a few examples of how we are incorporating artificial intelligence and machine learning into our materials development cycle. So let's begin with a hot topic, additive manufacturing. So the first example comes from the metal additive manufacturing space, where GE is investing heavily in manufacturing high temperature capable, high strength nickel alloy parts using direct metal laser melting or DMLM printing. So starting from the left hand of the slide, we use proprietary physics-based models to inform our initial conditions for additive alloy design and process parameter optimization. The models have been developed from decades of materials development experience here at GE. Now, because there are nearly 150 parameters that can control the outcome of an additive part, we have used probabilistic machine learning techniques, again, developed in-house to navigate the multivariate spaces so that we can go towards a specific material property objective, such as density, strength, or build productivity. So we design specific post-processing techniques for these materials and use proprietary automated defect detection and analysis tools to rapidly quantify the outcomes of our experiments. You can see an example of one of our experiments in the center with all these additive pins. Now we are also incorporating in situ sensors to further inform our models. These large amounts of data are then stored in a federated multimodal big data platform and then returned to the machine learning loops to further optimize our alloys. Finally, we have a legacy of excellence in mechanical test methods, and we have employed novel methods that fully leverage the flexibility afforded to us by additive manufacturing in order to screen out mechanical properties faster than we could in the past. So all combined, we have used frameworks like this to accelerate the development of additive specific alloys and variant alloys for additive by a factor of 5x over conventional development methods. And putting numbers to that, a new additive nickel-based super alloy was designed and proven viable for technological advancement in six months, during which time 40 different chemistries were experimentally screened using methods similar to the one shown here. Our second example comes from our ceramic matrix composite, or CMC supply chain. These materials are important because they represent the next step in fuel efficiency for aircraft engines. As such, GE has built a $1.5 billion supply chain in CMCs, and we now have made over 30,000 LEAP shrouds, LEAP being one of the main GE engines selling today. Looking forward, the upcoming GE 9X engine is going to have combustion liners, shrouds, stage one and stage two nozzles all made of CMCs. So it's critical that we understand the materials properties while we are making all this high volume CMC in production. So we have developed some machine learning based microstructure property models that can predict um, aspects of these materials like durability, ultimate tensile strength, interlaminate strength, and other thermoelastic properties. And all of these predictions have microstructural sensitivity. So there's a real need for us to be able to quantify a lot of the quality control microstructure information to make sure that our, proper, our materials meet spec. And the example here is just a, uh, an example showing fiber breaks detected in an X-ray CT scan of, of a CMC part. So initial efforts to create an automated microstructure quantification algorithm used rules-based systems. 
However, these were unable to account for material variability like texture and shape, and they were also very sensitive to the imaging parameters like lighting and mosaic stitching. So probabilistic and model-based methods effectively addressed some of these problems, but they were unable to scale up to larger data sets. Therefore, we used a technology we learned from a DARPA program on threat recognition using computer vision, and then we investigated a deep convolutional neural network approach, which used thousands of optical images as training images. An example of one of the optical images is shown on the top here is an optical micrograph of a CMC with a zoomed in location on the right. So this approach permits automated inspection and measurement of complex samples at scale. Parameters extracted are then used to ensure process control and aid in understanding the mechanical and physical properties. So here you can see the deep neural net segmentation representing probability predictions for the fibers, coatings, matrix, and silicon um, pieces in this, in this image. This, these results show the direct applicability of using a neural network to robustly characterize multiple materials in large data sets. Finally, rather than feeding data back into our models, let's discuss an example of AI that can be used by service engineers in the field. So the images along the top show typical blade distress levels apparent by looking at the thermal barrier coatings. Generally, a human inspector gives a distress ranking to each blade, and if the ranking is low enough, the blade is allowed to go back on wing. Previously, this was a manual and qualitative process. Examining one of these blades in more detail illustrates the challenges associated with characterizing distress in an automated way. We need to have an algorithm that can distinguish between TBC spallation, small cooling holes, and then small amounts of discoloration on the surface of the TBC. So what we've done is introduce a multi-scale, fully convolutional neural network into this inspection process. And the FCN has the property that allows any size of image as an input into the network. And it also lets us address variation in the size of the spallation going from large spall areas to non-spall areas to cooling holes to, to tiny spalls. So by being able to accurately quantify the spallation process used using image segmentation, this allows inspectors to detect problems consistently and early on and take corrective action. So this proposed multi-scale FCN as demonstrated in this video is, has very good accuracy for this application. So I'm showing a short video here running through a number of images and comparing what the, uh, the neural network is, is seeing. So in conclusion, I presented three examples of where we are incorporating AI into our work. However, our bulletin article highlights many other applications, including design assistance for traditional or subtractive manufacturing, um, tool life modeling and cooling hole drill optimization, augmented reality guided inspection, as seen in the upper right, and then surface stress estimation for low cycle fatigue prediction. I just wanna talk a little bit in this last example. What we're showing on the top is a binarized surface cross section from a micro CT data set of a part where yellow is metal and purple is the air surrounding it. Traditionally, stress predictions are done using finite element calculations, which can take several hours to perform. To speed this up, what we did is we trained a neural network on a set of finite element models, and now we can get pretty accurate stress predictions straight from the binarized images in a fraction of the time. So this is only occurring in about seconds. So new applications are continuously being tested, and in the future, we anticipate using AI and machine learning techniques heavily in alloy design and development, inverse material design, and topological optimization for additive design. So going forward, we believe the impact of AI on manufacturing and inspection will only increase. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rizzotto and Agora for the, the great talk. Uh, they are on the line uh, and happy to answer questions. I'll start with a uh, general question, which I think is uh, touches on uh, you know a lot of people's interest here. So what, what level of coding or programming expertise is needed to be doing ML? And a lot of folks doing these ML have backgrounds in Python, MATLAB, C++, Julia, et cetera. What do you recommend for, for starters and, and techniques to, to master? Hi, this is Dan. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm not a computer programmer. So I've been 
kind of picking this up as I go along. So as a follow-up question, so uh, models that, you know, you, you described a lot of different models. Um, you know, models like deep learning models typically require uh, a large, large number of labeled data to train them. Uh, how do you deal with this problem in the kinds of examples you talked about? Uh, all right. So for example, in the, um, the, the, the CMC quality inspection, one of the ways we've tried to play around with this, is there's two different approaches. One is, um, and, the, and they can be complementary. So the first one is, is I, I like to use um, with image J, there's a plugin called Weka, um, Weka trainable segmentation, and that's a pretty good one that uses more um, shallow, shallow learning techniques. So it's not a neural network, but it will go through and, and really uses a fast random forest model. Um, it allows the, you to annotate the images and then check and see how your model is doing for segmenting. And using that as a starting point, you can have an expert annotate, I don't know, five or 10 images. If you have a good model, you can even run that through a, through a script in, in image J to segment several tens of those images. The other thing to do is when you're training the neural network is a lot of these images, especially the optical ones are, are giant because we're looking at, oh, maybe 0.8 micron pixel resolution. Um, so 0.8 microns per pixel. And you can split up these images using a crop feature or a random crop feature, and then um, apply data augmentation techniques during the learning that that kind of really cause your data set to, to expand. Great. Um, as a, uh, a follow up here from coming to us from Queen Mary University of London, how important is it to perform high throughput experiments to generate databases? Uh, you, you talked about a number of different projects, um, some of which were probably, you know, much larger or smaller uh, database sizes than others. Um, this particular question is because of uh, the the, the, the person who asked it was, um, has been looking for ceramic materials and wanted to know about the effects of, for example, synthesis conditions and how one can, uh, if you have a large database with different synthesis conditions, how you can try to, you know, stitch that together in some meaningful way. Right. You, um, so for the synthesis conditions, I think you're going to need some domain expertise to, to try to figure out if you can normalize things. So, um, so rather than use um, just the temperature, try to get a normalized temperature so that there's a normalized temperature scale. The other thing is a lot of the high throughput characterization techniques we then feed into our own database. So we kind of have everything set up from the beginning and then we can use that to, to mine. Okay, great. Um, I, so I think, uh, you know, we, uh, we would like to now open up you know, the questions to sort of any of the, any of the other speakers who are on. So if uh, anyone else is on, welcome to jump in uh, to answer this. Just introduce yourself uh, prior to answering a question. Um, I, we had an earlier question about, um, that I'd like to circle back to, um, which is, uh, uh, are there any examples of how symbolic AI is used to impose physics-based constraints? Uh, how is this you know, different from specifying constraints in an optimization problem? So this is Carla. So I, get, I you know, uh, in the end, uh, and this this question comes from Chris. I, I great question, Chris. Uh, you know, the idea of using symbolic AI is really uh, uh, in the big picture. A lot of these problems, as you you uh, uh, put it, really convert. Uh, we convert them into optimization problems. Even you can think of you know machine learning really as. Uh, 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 optimizing some kind of loss function. So symbolic AI, indeed, it, when I talk about symbolic AI, I'm talking about including, you know, logic. I'm talking about including search. And and you are familiar with with all these, these uh, techniques, I'm sure, that uh, even though sometimes we label, uh, or now people label them as machine learning. For example, Monte Carlo tree search is a, a good example where we we are going to explore a lot, a, a very large amount of 
possibilities uh, uh, embedding you know the the suggestions given by 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 let's say a deep learning algorithm but but this is more uh, uh, symbolic you know that's why we as opposed to the straightforward regression techniques that machine learning provides so essentially they are not very different it is when i talk about symbolic ai i'm talking about you know incorporating logic that often we end up uh, incorporating as as relaxations uh, that can be uh, 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 optimized and even differentiated or search or you know then uh, planning algorithms so there are many possibilities uh, how to combine this symbolic ai and embed them into optimization wonderful wonderful um so we are we're just about out of time um but i i want to throw kind of a a question out there for anyone who, who feels like uh, taking it, which is that, you know, um, it, I don't know if five years ago, it sounds like some people have been in this field for, for much longer than that, but uh, five years ago, it'd be difficult to think that uh, you, we'd be at this point talking about the impact of machine learning and materials to this degree. And I'm curious about what, what you think it's going to be like in five years. How will we be talking about machine learning? Will we be working alongside robot scientists on a daily basis? What, just give us a, you know, a vision of the future here. And the future is open to interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I think it is, you know, I think this is a very exciting opportunity. I think this field will uh, accelerate dramatically, actually, research in AI and vice versa. I, you know, what you see now, for example, uh, in biology, I think, uh, you know, like genome sequence, etc. I think we will uh, see uh, 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 great progress in AI. We'll see uh, a bit of uh, for for very well defined tasks, you know, but uh, uh, autonomous systems. I think we can start seeing that, and uh, uh, and I think we AI will really create tremendous uh, opportunities and accelerate dramatically uh, uh, materials discovery and vice versa. <laughs> <clears throat> so okay, so uh, my my two cents here is that uh, I'm sorry if I can quickly add in you know, yeah. a couple of points. Uh, uh, you know, with respect to what uh, Professor Gums was mentioning, is that I, I think whatever covered in this webinar so far is you know I think it, it, it's fairly broad, but there are actually more topics uh, that we haven't covered. You know, which was enabled by some of the exciting developments in computer science, such as natural language processing and so on and so forth. So. So I believe in the next five years or so, I think we will, I think we will still be exploring different methods and, and trying to figure out what is the right question to ask, and uh, uh, you know, which is really exciting as, as, as a scientist here, and, uh, and and hopefully, you know, as a community, we can all converge together to to really address difficult problems. That's how I see it. Maybe in five years. Fantastic. Okay. Well. Uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll thank all of our, our speakers again, and thank you for sticking around answering questions. It's been very enlightening. Uh, and now I will toss this back over to Bob Brockler of MRS to wrap things up.